three, two, one. Let's rock and roll. Good morning, Lakeway. Good morning. For those who are online, you could have stayed in bed and you're here with us. We're glad to have you. Hey, like us on Facebook and just say, hey, glad to see you, Lakeway. And then for us, those who are here this morning, uh, glad you're here. It's good to be back to home. Uh, Kelly and I were away last weekend and uh, we missed you guys. Um, as far as we miss you, <laughs> y'all yes. miss me too. For those who are new to Lakeway, we do have a registration card right in front of your chairs. Go ahead and fill that out. We just want to see who's uh, visited us and then just say a little thank you for coming to join us this morning. Also in front of your chairs, there's a, a prayer request card. You can go ahead and fill it out now. So later on, when we take on our offerings at the end of the service, you can just drop that prayer request in there along with your tithes. Those that are online, you can actually go and visit us on Tithely and then, uh, or just drop off your checks here at the church. With that say, said, let's give thanks to the Lord. I'm going to pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. What a glorious day you've created. Lord, thank you for this family coming together and just allow us to worship you and enjoy the music to your ears. Lord, be with us as we praise you this morning. Amen. Amen. All right, stand up this morning. You who are online out there, you stand up too. Get out of that chair, okay? Let's let God arise in our heart this morning. Ready? Hear the holy roar of God's resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who will save. Our God is a God who will save. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns. And the church will stand, she will endure. He holds the key to life, our Lord. Death has no strength, no final word. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Battle. 
Isn't that great? God fights our battles for us. But, you know, we got to do our part, too. And the one thing that God has over a great friend is that God's not going to lead you down the wrong, wrong road. If we follow God, it's going to be for the best that we need to do. Just remember that. Follow God. That's right. And we're going to teach you a new song this morning. Well, some of you may not be new to you. But it's called I Will Follow. This is a song that we brought into our men's retreat. So you guys probably remember this a little bit, but it's a great song about following where God is leading us, right? Amen. Let's see if we can get this. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your days are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. i 
song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Father, you are worthy of all our praise. You're worthy of our hearts and our life, Lord. Right now, Lord, we ask that you just fill us with your spirit as you bring this message from Mike, Lord, that will touch our hearts in a way that we will walk out of here changed. Something new in us will click, and we will show more love. We will show more mercy and more grace to those around us. Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning morning to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you are with us. We are, um, we're in a mini-series. I didn't realize this until this week. (laughs) We're in a mini-series I've called Journey to Jerusalem. We're heading towards Easter, and uh, we're going to look at some of the incredible events, incredible encounters that Jesus had on that journey to Jerusalem. Some of them take place in Jerusalem leading up to Easter. Last week, we looked at an event involving Jesus and his disciples and a child, and it was an object lesson in humility, whereas Jesus teaches his disciples that if you want to get into heaven, you've got to do it the kid's way. They can get all of our messages and go to our website, our Facebook page, um, get the app, and you can download them or listen to them online. Today, we're going to look at an encounter I've been stuck on this passage of scripture for weeks, just reading it, reading it, reading it. Just something was in there, and it's like, man, it's it's such a wonderful encounter. It's it's so fascinating. It takes a whole chapter. There are very few incidents in the Gospels where there's a whole chapter dedicated to one event. Typically, there's like six, seven, eight. It's like Jesus must have been exhausted. But this whole chapter is taken up by this one event. And then if you read on, you you realize that two-thirds of the following chapter also refers to this same event. It it is so remarkable that it inspired one of the best-known Christian songs ever, Amazing Grace. The encounter is found in John chapter 9. If you've got your Bible, um, you can... Read it, follow along. If you don't, we're going to have it up on the screen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. As soon as I get into this, most of you will know this passage of Scripture, but it's just a great one. So John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to do the whole chapter. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins Or his parents' sins. So right away the disciples make a judgment. They make an observation and and, and they make a judgment. He is this way because of some sin. He's blind. He's a beggar. He's a sinner. You get what you deserve. God blesses the good and punishes the bad. That was the the thought in those days. Now the problem with, with that thought pattern is that what the disciples did, maybe without even thinking about it, is they assumed a higher moral ground. Well, this guy is blind because of his sin. We're not blind because of our righteousness. Jesus consistently taught that we're all sinners. I mean, if we all got what we deserved, we'd all be blind beggars. Not only that, Don't attribute your good fortune to your good behavior. The Bible clearly teaches that the Lord makes the sun shine on the good and the bad, the rainfall on the good and the bad. It's got nothing to do with that stuff. Yes, God does bless us when we follow him, but to to take it to this level is kind of, I'm so much better than he is. He's a blind beggar. We're not a blind beggar. Now, Jesus doesn't even address the issue in in this account because something bigger is going on. Verse 3, he says, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. So there's a greater purpose to this event. Now, interestingly, unlike most encounters with Jesus that we read in the Gospels, this guy hasn't called out for help. He didn't say anything to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, come, come. None of that is going on. He doesn't ask Jesus for anything. Jesus sees him. Jesus makes the contact. 
Now, what's fantastic about this passage of Scripture, this is preordained. He says, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. It's not a chance encounter. This is a divine appointment written in, in all of eternity. This time and this place, this thing is going to happen. It's absolutely incredible. The blind man has no clue what's about to transpire. He's in his usual begging spot. He's probably got a choice spot there where people pass by and he can shout out to them, food, please. Yeah, I love this stuff. You see this in the, in, in the Gospels. And you start thinking about what has to happen. How many lives are divinely involved for this occurrence to happen at this place at this time? For so many things. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely incredible. Jesus had to intentionally go to this place at this time knowing this blind guy is going to be there. And a specific set of circumstances has to happen for that blind guy to be there. Maybe stretch him back for years. For him to be in that place at that time in that condition. God ordained this meeting. It was predestined to bring glory to God. And we see that a number of times in, in the scripture. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus climbs up a tree. God's walking along. He knows him by name. That doesn't just happen. When the disciples are, are with a triumphant entry, when Jesus sends the disciples to get the donkey, if you read about that, there's a whole set of circumstances. If you go into town, you're going to see a guy carrying a water jar. Follow the guy carrying a water jar. He'll take it. Same thing with the Last Supper. I might have those two mixed up there. But it's a divine appointment. This man does not ask for healing, nor does he seek Jesus. Jesus seeks healing. Him. And Jesus tells us right at the get-go what the purpose of this is. The power of God will be seen in this man, in this blind man. So he continues on with a, a really fascinating comment. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. Look at the pronouns here. We, us, us, and then tasks is plural. If you ever question whether the Lord is calling you to join him in his work, here's your answer. We, we're in this together. We must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. Ephesians 2.20 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Isn't that incredible that way before you existed, God had already planned works assigned to you. And then Jesus is telling us, you don't tarry with this stuff. You don't just sit on this stuff wondering, oh, should I do something for Jesus? Am I supposed to be involved in all of this? He said, no, get on with it, man. There's a window of opportunity, and we must take advantage of it. I think what Jesus is saying to us, have your radar up all the time. Be looking for my activity and join me in it. He continues. He says, the night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, let me explain that. Jesus isn't saying that once he's gone, the work's done. Because it's nighttime, you know? Nighttime, shut her down, guys. We're done with this. Jesus is making a point about the urgency of the work. I'm here right now. We better get on this work. I am the light of the world. But if you read further on in Scripture, Jesus goes on to tell us, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to empower you to continue to do my work. And you will be the light of the world. And then I love these next few verses. I love this whole passage. This is so weird. <laughs> then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. How much spit does it take to make mud? <laughs> I mean, they're in the Middle East. It's like being out in West Texas. It's dry, right? 
it, it's so weird, and it's gross. It's lucky the guy was blind. <laughs> You're going to do what with that? <laughs> I mean, the first thing he knows, somebody's rubbing mud on his eyes. It's like, what's going on here? Jesus told him, he said, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Now, this is worth digging into a little bit. We know from other scriptures, Jesus didn't need to spit on the ground and make blood, make mud. He didn't need to, to send this guy to the pool. I mean, Jesus doesn't need a magic potion. I'm going to rub this on your eyes. It's going to fix your eyes and go wash it off and, and you'll see. He didn't need any of that. There are other occurrences where we know that Jesus cured blindness with a word. There are some times when he touched the person and cured them. There was none of this mud thing, go wash in the pool. So why this method this time in this strange situation where this guy hasn't encountered Jesus, hasn't asked for healing? Why this method this time? Well, the primary purpose of this miracle isn't the blind man receiving his sight. Jesus has already told us this. The primary, that's secondary. The primary purpose is that the power of God will be seen in this man's life. So this is a public demonstration of God's power in his man. Jesus doesn't talk about faith or forgiveness. That's not mentioned in this event. It's simply a demonstration of God's power. Now, seeing a blind man struggling to make his way to the pool of Siloam with mud dripping down his face must have, must have been quite a sight. People are like, where is he going? Where is the pool? He's got mud dripping down his face. It's going to attract attention. There is nothing arbitrary about the kingdom of God. You know, everything, everything that happens has a purpose. And sometimes we get wrapped up in things and we think, well, that's kind of mundane. What's the purpose of that? And we start trying to analyze things and we can't see things from God's eyes. You have no idea what God is doing. What he's doing in you and through you and to you, you have no idea. Even the simplest of tasks is important. You just trust and you act. This whole scenario was set out before this blind man came into existence. So, and, and this is so interesting. So Jesus sends him to a pool called Scent. Who named the pool? Who chooses Scent as a name for a pool? That's weird, isn't it? You've got no idea what God is doing. Sometime way back, God prompted somebody to build this pool in this place and call it sent. Because this guy is going to be sent there. Go to the pool called sent and wash. So the man washed, he came back seeing. Can you imagine? I started thinking about this. You ever see those... Those YouTube videos of people that wear those chroma glasses, they've got color blindness, and they see color for the first time, and they're like, wow, this guy's been blind from birth. He goes down to the pool, and he washes, and now he can see. How incredible. I mean, you can't describe blue to a blind person. Where's, where's your starting point? Green, red, yellow, orange. There, there's no starting point. He can't imagine how wonderful everything looks. It's just, there's no starting point. So he washes his eyes, he comes up. Can you imagine what he thought? Things that before, you know, it was just touch. All of a sudden, what is that? Well, that's called green. Wow. What's that? Well, that's red. Wow. I mean, how incredible must it have been? It carries on. It says, his neighbors and others who knew him as the blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was. Others said, nope. He just looks like him. But the beggar kept on saying, yeah, it's me. It's me. Now, I can understand why they didn't recognize him. Can you imagine the look on his face? He's gone from this and miserable because he has to beg every day for food to wow. I mean, his face is going to look different. Is that the beggar? No, that, nah, that can't be the beggar. Nah, nah. Is it the beggar? It's me. Yes, I'm him, and I can see this guy must have been floating on air. 
They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud, spread it over my eyes, told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam and go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed. And now I see. The man, he doesn't know. He, he has no clue about it. The man they call Jesus. You know that, that Jesus guy? He doesn't know anything about Jesus. So all he knows, I can see. I couldn't see. And now I can see. And I love this. He, he's no theologian, just a simple witness. Sometimes we, we make it so complicated when we think about being a witness for Jesus, like, I've got to have all of this theology. No, you don't. It's simple. Just tell your story. So they carry on. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know. He replied. I wonder. Hmm. I wonder if for him to find his way back, it would be easier for him to close his eyes. Because he's used to doing this, right? He doesn't recognize things. <laughs> then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. Because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. What a sad commentary on the human condition. Hard hearts. This guy is just, wow! And all they're thinking, you know it's Saturday. We don't do this stuff on Saturday. You better come with us. He may not have known where they were taking him. All they cared about, that there, there was no celebration that this man had got his sight back, that God had forgiven him of his sins, which is what that es in essence made. It's Saturday. This sucks. <laughs> this is how rigid they were. So God set the Sabbath as a special day for us. But then over time, the Jewish ruling leaders added so many rules to define what was work and what wasn't work. So God said, don't work on the Sabbath. And that was, you know, emphasized in the promised land when they had the manna. On Saturday, you pick, on Friday, you pick up enough for two days. Every other day, just one day, because I don't want you working on the Sabbath. But they had defined it to, to this point. You could spit on the Sabbath. If you wanted to clear your throat, you could spit on the Sabbath as long as your spittle didn't roll in the dust. If your spittle rolled in the dust, that's work. And now you have broken the law of the Sabbath. Well, Jesus spits and he's making mud out of it. I mean, it's sad, isn't it? The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, <laughs> this is like the third time now, he put mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. You wouldn't do this on the Sabbath. You wouldn't heal someone if you were of God. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division among, a deep division of opinion among them. So the Pharisees are separated on this. They're not sure what to make of it. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. Ooh, that ain't going to go down well. The Jewish leaders still refused. This is a key word here. Still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called his parents. God wouldn't do this on the Sabbath. I don't think this guy was ever blind. Let's talk to his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. 
That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So you've got confusion, you've got division, and now you've got manipulation. They don't want to believe. And the thing that they don't want to believe is that Jesus is of God. So there's confusion. And here's the weird thing. (laughs) They don't know what to believe, but they know what they don't want to believe. We don't want to believe that this is Jesus. And they've already made up their mind about Jesus, and they've put it out there. Anybody, anybody who believes that this Jesus is the Son of God is going to be cast out of the synagogue. But they've got a problem. Because there's a blind guy who can see. And they don't know what to do with this. The evidence of, of who Jesus is standing right in public in front of them. So they go back around again. You, you, it's like kids, right? If they don't get the answer from one person, they just keep going to find the answer they want. So they go back around again. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. So they're coming at it from a different angle. It's a win for all of us here, guys. We admit you can see. We know God did it. Let's not include Jesus. All you got to do is deny that it was anything to do with Jesus. God gets the glory. We're all good. But this guy, he's like, no, 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 no. I know what happened to me. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied. But I know this. I was blind, and now I see. So simple. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, I told you once. Didn't you listen? (laughs) Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? He's kind of jabbing at them now. It's like, oh, slap upside the head. It gets worse. (laughs) This guy's good. Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses. We don't even know where this man comes from. It's kind of like, who are you to talk to us like that? But he's not done. (laughs) Jesus gave him the best gift of his life up until now, and he's not done. Well, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes. And yet, you don't know where he comes from. It's kind of like, aren't you the teachers of the law? Aren't you the experts in all this stuff? This guy healed my eyes. You can't figure it out. Like, just help me understand. He's switching it on them. And then he continues. It gets better. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If if this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. It's like drop the microphone, boom, deal with that. (laughs) And what he's doing, he's pointing out their hypocrisy. He's slapping them right in the face with this stuff. He knows the hypocrisy in their hearts. Everybody can see that it was Jesus. Everybody knows that only a person of God can do this. You're choosing not to believe. It's not my problem. It's your problem. Now, now it gets nasty. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? Do you know who we are? And they threw him out of the synagogue. So two things they do here with this statement. Number one, they shame him. And number two, they cast him out. So in essence, they're admitting to the healing. By saying you're you're a sinner, they're saying you were blind. That's because you were a sinner. A total sinner. And then they pass a sentence on the fellow that's almost too difficult to bear. They cast him out of the synagogue. Now what that meant, the synagogue was the center of Jewish life. If you needed forgiveness or anything, you would go to the priest who would give alms or or sacrifice for you in the synagogue. If you can't get to the synagogue, if you're not allowed in the synagogue, it means you're separated from God. Not only are you separated from God, you are completely ostracized from community. At least as a blind beggar, he's a sinner. He knows he's a sinner. People will give you food. 
As someone who's cast out of the synagogue, you are now an anti-Jew. No one's going to talk to you. No one's going to hire you. No one's going to feed you. You are completely ostracized. This is just, this is a, a, a terrible thing to do to a person. And I wonder if going through his mind, he's not thinking, better to be a blind beggar than to be sighted and cast out. They popped his bubble. I love this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Jesus seeks this guy out again. He's been off ostracized. He's been shamed. Now Jesus has, has heard about this. He's going through, anybody seen, where's the blind beggar guy? And he's looking for this fellow, and he finds this fellow. The man answers, oh, gosh, I love this. Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. The exact opposite of the Pharisees. I want to believe in him. All of his life, this fellow has lived in shame. He's a blind beggar because of the sin in his life. That was the question that the disciples asked, right? Even rejected by his parents. The Jews had this weird belief that you could sin in the womb. And if you're born with some form of deformity, it is because of the sin you committed in the womb. Now, one of the reasons they wanted to believe that is because if it wasn't your sin, it was their sin. So it's better to believe that this baby sinned than I sinned. And it's kind of an undercurrent of this story. He's a blind beggar, but his parents are there. Why aren't they supporting him? Because he's a blind beggar. He's a sinner. And that's the life that he has lived. But after experiencing Jesus, he wants to believe. And I love what Jesus says to him next. You have seen him, Jesus said. And he is speaking to you. What sweet words to say to a man who was born blind. You have seen him. He could have said, I'm he. He said, you have seen him. And that is the most important statement in this whole encounter. Yes, Lord, I believe the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Now, here's why this is the most important sentence. His eyes are opened once again. He's cured of his blindness once again. First physically, now spiritually. Sight is good but insight is better. And he worshiped Jesus. His eyes are open. I can see red, green, black, blue, and all these other things, but I can see Jesus. This is Jesus. This is the one of God. My eyes are open. And he worshiped. And, and it's more than a simple thank you. It's a worship of the Spirit. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So, so what? What's it got to do with us? Why did God allow a whole chapter to be dedicated to this one incident? So I have a question for you. Well, let, me, let me set this up. Think about this man. Put yourself in his shoes for a minute. He spent half his life blind. Begging, scorned, just for this event to happen. He could have been so resentful. All of my life, I've been blind. I've been rejected. I've been scorned. I had to beg. I've been the object of ridicule. All of my life, that was intentional for this. 
Couldn't this have happened when I was free? You know, are you, are you just playing with people? Sucks to be me. It's not fair. I mean, I could see that. Once you kind of settle down, hang on a minute, I've been blind all this time on purpose. You know, the reality, we're all afflicted to some degree with something. Fear, anger, bitterness, hurt, pain, loneliness, anxiety, addictions, hurts, habits, hang-ups. We're all broken sinners, right? And just as Jesus wanted to use this fellow to display the power of God, I believe that Jesus wants to use you to display the power of God. Now, here's the bad news. We're all broken. But he doesn't always heal our afflictions. Paul went to the Lord three times, it says. I got this thorn in my side. We never know what the thorn is. But it's something in his life. And three times he goes to God and says, can you take it away? Can you take it away and take it away? And God says, no, no, and no. My grace is sufficient. So this is where it gets tough. If in humility, we turn our brokenness, we turn our hurts, our hang-ups, our habits, our addictions, our shame. To God, he will use them. I believe that's the reason we don't read about this blind beggar ha having a hissy fit. In that moment, when Jesus opened his spiritual eyes, he realized that our physical condition, and I preach this often, our physical condition is not as important as our spiritual condition. And God will use discomfort in our physical condition to bring about holiness and health in our spiritual condition. He will use discomfort to bring about spiritual wholeness, both in us and maybe more importantly to the people around us. Because the significance of what happens in the hereafter is so much more important than what happens in the here and the now. But it's difficult for us to get our heads around that when we're suffering and we're in pain and people are hurting because we live in the here and now, right? The pain is real. And we pray, God, will you get rid of this pain? We get rid of this pain. And sometimes God says, no, but I'm going to use that pain if you will let me. We're all spiritually blind to some degree. So I have a question. Here's your question. If your affliction or your brokenness, or your suffering enabled you to speak truth and spiritual healing into somebody else's life and maybe change their eternity, would it be worth it? If you had to spend half of your life blind in order for someone's eternity to be changed, would it be worth it? It's hard. So this is a divine encounter. I wonder what the rest of his day was like. I wonder what his tomorrow was like and all of his tomorrows. I wonder how many lives were changed because of this divine encounter. And what I love about this, he wasn't a theologian or a biblical expert. He couldn't even read. Had probably never had a job. And yet when questioned by the Pharisees, he boldly told his story. I don't know about this Jesus guy. I don't know all the theology that you know. I don't know any of that stuff. All I know, I was blind, and now I can see, and Jesus did it. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> you know, lately I've been talking a lot about our mission statement. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, transform people into fully devoted followers of God. And I've been talking about this journey that each and every one of us is on from who we are now to who Jesus 
is transforming us to be, this fully devoted follower of him. And, and what does that look like? What, what are the attributes of this person? Well, one of the attributes of that person, and maybe the most important attribute of that person, is that they are a storyteller. They're a storyteller. Every single Christ follower in this room, those watching online, you have a story. At some point in your lives, your eyes were open. Something spiritually changed within you. You were blind, but now you see. And it doesn't matter how big or how small your story is. I, I, sometimes I talk to people, they say, you know, Pastor Mike, I don't have a big story. You know, Barry was sharing last week, you know, I grew up in church. I was in church in my mom's womb. And all my life I've been in church. That doesn't matter. Everybody has a story. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, at some point your eyes were opened. And you made a decision. And we are commanded to tell our story. It's our responsibility to bring light and sight into a world of darkness. I want you to consider something. This was a divine encounter. Maybe you are the divine encounter in someone's life. Think about that for a minute. Maybe you are a divine encounter in someone's life. And the question, I guess, that we have to wrestle with is, what are you going to do with Jesus' truth in your life? We've got to tell our stories. Now, what people do with it, it's up to them. You look at all the, the different people in this story. You've got the blind beggar. Well, we know where he's at. I was blind. I can say, whoa, Jesus. <laughs> he's happy. His parents. Huh. They know what's happened. They're struggling with it because they've got a group of religious leaders that are holding a big hammer over their head. If you say this, Jesus is the Messiah, we're casting you out. So they're, they're in a difficult situation. So they don't know what to do with the information. The Pharisees split into two groups. Some have made their mind up. Nah, don't believe it. Don't want to believe it. Others are, are confused. Like, this has to be God. I, I don't know what to do with this. And then there's the general people. They took them right to the Pharisees, right? Saturday. See, what people do with their story, your story, you have no control over that. We're just commanded to tell our story because we're part of this story. This guy is still speaking truth into our lives and has been speaking truth into people's lives for 2,000 years. My sister, Maria, Karen was the one that you met here. I have another sister, Maria. She's not a nun. It just sounds like a nun. <laughs> a couple of guys knocked on her door one day. She opened her door. They talked to her about Jesus. She accepted Jesus into her heart as their Lord and Savior, and then they left. And she never knew those guys, never saw them again. And it had a significant impact on her life. It changed her life. Sandra and myself. Jesus changed our lives. And I'm not going to go into details. I've shared some of this with you. My mom, who had some sort of Christian background. She grew up in a convent. So she had something that usually leads to no Christian life. But... <laughs> I remember one time in Canada, she said to me, you know, Maria, Maria's got something. And when I come over here and I see you and Sandra, you, you've got something too. And I, I don't know what it is that you have. I want it. And on the top of a mountain in Banff National Park, she gave Jesus her life. My dad, who was sitting at the bottom of the mountain, didn't want to have anything to do with God. A couple of years later, he accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And when he was challenged at a party in England, because they were laughing at my mom, he stood up and said, you need to know something. 
I'm a Christian too, over witness that I received in Canada and the change that I saw in my wife. And then my sister Karen, who baptized last year. But it doesn't always go that way. I remember one time we were, used to have a small group in stands in the pub. It was a great small group for many reasons. <laughs> but you'd get people. You can't help it. If you're in a pub and you're sitting around a table and you've got your Bibles open and you're talking about God, people are going to come over like, what's going on here? And I went and visited one time and this Aussie girl comes over and she's kind of interested. She was a little inebriated. I think she'd been drinking all the way from Australia to here. But it piqued her interest. She didn't sit and join us, but she said, I'd like to know more. So when this group was done, I went and sat with her, shared my story. <laughs> she laughed in my face. You've got to be some kind of an idiot. Really? God changed you? Pfft. It doesn't matter. We have no responsibility over what people do with our story. I don't know how that might affect her sometime down the road. Something changes in her life and, oh man, that guy told me about Jesus. We're just commanded to tell our story. Right, let me finish this up. There's a couple of verses more. These are grim. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. So the Pharisees didn't want to believe. Even though Jesus overwhelmed them with evidence, they chose to reject the evidence. Sometimes God gives us what we want. I want to be blind. No problem. Got it covered. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? Duh. <laughs> But look what Jesus says, and this is actually, when you delve into this, these are some of the most chilling words in all of the Gospels. If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. It was a stark warning. They are worse than blind. They are hard-hearted. And here is the judgment that Jesus is rendering. If you're truly blind, you're not held guilty. You know, who's asked the question, well, what about the little kid who lives in Indonesia who never had a chance to hear about Jesus? If we go strictly by the Bible, they go to hell. I don't think so. I think that God's got a bit more grace in him than that. How could they possibly make a decision if they never hear? If you're blind, you're not going to be held guilty. But... If you see the truth and you reject the truth, then you will be judged. To deny the work of the Holy Spirit, or worse, this is what these Pharisees were doing, to attribute that work to Satan is to grieve the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that is the only sin that is unforgivable. Don't be that person. <laughs> if you see the truth, accept the truth, and respond to the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And tell your story. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I just love that passage of Scripture. And I thank you for all of those who are here, those who are watching online, Father, at that point in our lives when we became spiritually sighted. And we saw you for who you are. And we accepted you into our lives as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that we would now have the courage to do what this blind beggar did, formerly blind beggar did, and that is to tell our stories about how you opened our eyes. Father, would you bring divine interventions into our lives, cross our lives with people, so that we can tell the truth of who you are in our lives. And Father, I pray 
too for those who are listening who have seen the truth and are sitting on the fence afraid to take a step. Father, I pray that they realize the grave danger that they are in. And if that's you, you're watching online, or if that's you that's here, it's so simple. Simple prayer. Jesus, I believe. Give me the faith to believe. I believe you change lives. Open my eyes that I may see and come into my life. I need you. I want you. Amen. Amen. Now a word from our sponsor. Well, guys, I have a story to tell. On March 3rd, 4th, and 5th, we had 33 men that made a commitment to join the men's retreat this year and talking about life change. So, praise God. So, if you're with me behind your, in your bulletin behind the back, there's several different announcements. For those that are online, please join us. Look at events 
and you'll see a lot of these uh, events coming up. But um, what a praise. Back in February, we had uh, Chief Calhoun that actually joined us for men's breakfast. And I remember, I think it was Mo that made a comment to him because uh, uh, he led us in uh, a session. And Mo said, you know, back in the day, I remember that we used to pray for the officers of the colony. And so he said, you know, we hadn't done that in a while. And we asked him, why not? So this church is much more than just the folks in this sanctuary. It's about praying for our community. It's about praying for the officers in, uh, in blue, EMS, first responders. And lo and behold, guess what? <laughs> we now have a prayer card for our police officers in the colony. And we need to be lifting them up. In the foyer, you're going to find two documents. The first one is you write your name right here, and it says that you're praying for this particular officer. Leave that behind. Put it right next to the basket. We're going to share that with the officer that you're praying with. And for the person that you have, the officer's name, keep it with you. And hold on to that. And every time you look at that, pray for that officer. Now, David, where you at? You can't hold all the officers that are on patrol this week and have them all in your cars for your luxury, just in case you get pulled over. But for those <laughs> others, guys, grab a card. There's also a blue ribbon. Put it on your windshield or your uh, antenna. Illustrate that we care for our officers, men and women, that are serving this community. As far as announcements, several to talk about. VBS volunteer training, immediately after this service at 12 o'clock, we're going to be coming together. We're going to talk about the kids, and that's coming up in July. But uh, Libby actually has a training session for us that all want to be a part of VBS. And if you're curious and you're wondering, hey, how can I help, join us at 12 o'clock. It's a short session, but it also talks about our planning and what we're looking to do for this community and the kids. Uh, the next one, women's ministry. Oh, this one's next Sunday. So first quarter birthday celebration. So this is all the ladies can join. They're going to celebrate first quarter birthdays. On top of that, they're going to reveal their sister, y'all, y'all, sisterhood. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, we need to do the offering first. If I can have those that are taking up the offering, come on up. And I'll keep on going. Yeah, I'll get carried away here. And it actually says ushers up front. Um, so the reveal party, and this is what's really, really cool. You talk about 33 men committing to changing their lives. Over 45 to 50 women attend our women's retreat uh, each and every year. I was talking to my uh, niece, or Kelly's niece. They go to a mega church in Houston. And they said, we can't even get 40 to do anything, much less to go to a retreat. Wow, that's amazing. So God is good. Um, let me go ahead and do the offering, then we'll continue with announcements. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, so many times I talk about uh, just throwing ourselves in that basket as it goes around. Lord, you want us. You want our hearts. Lord, as you uh, just thank you for this church. Thank you for all the families that support this church. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, we just want you to bless these tithes and offerings that we have to honor and glorify you. So as the uh, offering basket goes around, Lord, uh, allow us to just jump in and serve and give our tithes and money to you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple other announcements. So be a part of that. Ladies, you're invited for next, uh, uh, next week. And then uh, Lakeway Ministry Fair, we'll talk about more of that in April. Um, sign up. This is your opportunity to sign up for the Women's Theme Dinner in your bulletin. Great opportunity to enjoy great food, great company with the ladies. And then, uh, David, are you in here? David Edmonston. So, guys, uh, we actually do our own grounds here. If you're new to Lakeway, we actually support the, the groundkeeping of Lakeway Baptist Church. And we need to be good stewards of uh, the equipment that we have, but also uh, be a part of this community and making sure that our grounds are kept. You're looking to serve? Asking for two hours once a month. And what that means is being a rotation of four teams, one team per month, and there's four on a team, and two hours of your time. You come up on a Saturday morning or you can come up on a Thursday, ride a 90-degree uh, turn lawnmower, really have a good time with your headphones on and just jam out and mow the lawn. 
or you can edge, you can trim. But if you're looking to serve and you say, hey, I can't do it in children's, I don't know if I can do this. If you can ride a lawnmower, run a weed eater, see David Edmonston, raise your hand. Uh, love to have you join us. And uh, that's coming around real soon. And, and then we're actually having somebody, if you want to be a part of flower beds, flower bed cleanup, et cetera. Again, trying to beautify this church so we can represent this community well. All right, with that, let's go ahead and say grace and we'll dismiss. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for today's message. Well, we all have a story to share. And Lord, to be able to be bold and courageous and just be able to share what you've done to each one of our lives and how you've changed our lives and what you've done. Lord, I just thank you. Lord, as we go out into the community this week, Lord, I ask that you protect us, you guide us, but you also give us the boldness and the create, be courageous to actually share the testimony that we have. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this church body. I thank you for our pastor. Lord, I ask for a hedge of protection over us as we do and say things that honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we all say. You are dismissed. Have a blessed week.